uh, about, uh, give you a tiny bit of background about Koch and then, uh, and then uh, give you a, a, a very quick kind of run through of the first chapter, the one that I asked uh, everybody to do as homework, and then basically just give you a chance to uh, get started on it right now. Uh, and run into any install problems or IDE problems or things like that uh, in a context where there are people around to help. So that's the plan for the next 40 minutes or so. So to begin with, uh, why are what proof assistants a suitable topic for this summer school? Uh, why, do we, why, why are we spending time on, uh, on this topic? There are a few reasons. Uh, may be connected, but, uh, but not necessarily. So one reason is that, um, is that proof assistance and caulk in particular uh, is a really beautiful uh, illustration or embodiment of all of the theory that, uh, that you've been hearing about so far and that you'll hear about in the coming days. Uh, Koch's core is a dependently typed functional programming language. That is to say, uh, a powerful uh, constructive logic. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's really nice to, uh, to get a chance to uh, get these concepts under your fingers in a way that is difficult to do with just pencil and paper work on, uh, on exercises. So this is one motivation. The other motivation uh, is that Proof assistants are beginning to be very much used in uh, research on programming languages. And the reason is uh, basically that people were beginning, well, starting quite a while ago, starting maybe 20 years ago, but then with increasing urgency, people were beginning to feel that they were overwhelmed by the scale of the, uh, of the problems that they were trying to, of the, uh, of the proofs that they were trying to do. So, Back in the good old days, 40 or 50 years ago, uh, you could write a nice paper about, we didn't call it programming languages then, but it was, uh, and, uh, and even up to you know, the first decade or two of Popple, uh, you could write a really nice paper about programming languages by writing down a system of six rules and then beating it to death for, uh, for many pages. And, uh, and each of the proofs would be you know, interesting and deep and short and easy to check. Uh, and those days are not completely gone, but if you look at a typical Popple paper now about some interesting programming language feature, the definition can go on for pages. Uh, and the proofs can go on for dozens or sometimes more than 100 pages. And, uh, and if you think about uh, how confident, uh, would, you put, would you stake your life or, uh, or even a lot of money on the absolute correctness of a proof that goes on for 100 pages? No, of course not. That's ridiculous. Uh, no one, not even the authors, can check uh, a proof that goes on that long. Possibly one person has checked it carefully, but I think probably not even that. So how are we going to be confident about proofs that are that big? Well, fortunately, proofs that are that big tend to be boring. This is both good and bad. If you're checking them by hand, it's bad. But if, you, uh, but if you want automated support, it's good because it means that there's some hope. And, uh, and so what people have been doing is uh, just forced by uh, the, uh, the, the facts of scale that, uh, that the field is dealing with uh, have been more and more moving into uh, formalizing and mechanizing their results. Uh, mechanization has other benefits. It has many costs, which you'll be finding out. Uh, but it has, it has some, uh, some hidden benefits as well. One huge benefit uh, is malleability. So even if it were possible to carefully check a 100-page proof, as soon as you've changed the definition a little bit uh, and now the whole 100 pages needs to be checked again, now it's completely impossible. So if the, if the definition itself is big enough to be interesting, it's going to be big enough to be changing. And, uh, and that means that being able to prove something about it once and then fiddle with the definition a little bit and then see what you need to alter in the proof uh, and so on uh, is an enormous win. Uh, 
Structuring your proofs so that you can do that is a whole topic unto itself, um, which perhaps we'll talk about a little bit later in the week. But, uh, but at least you have some hope. Um, there are other benefits. Uh, formalization is sufficiently difficult that uh, even a slight infelicity or suboptimality in your definition uh, makes maybe a factor of two or a factor of 10 or a factor of 100 difference in the, in the difficulty of doing the proofs. Uh, and if the proofs are taking you many, many, many uh, hours, dozens or hundreds of hours, uh, you're going to put in the work to make the definitions as beautiful as possible. And from the point of view of science, that's good. Okay, so, uh, so proof assistants are a, a natural topic for, uh, for this summer school. Um, there are many different kinds of proof assistants. Uh, there are fully automated theorem provers. Uh, there are fully manual proof checkers that do nothing but uh, look at a fully detailed proof and, uh, and check that the rules have been applied uh, correctly in a very local way. And then there are in the middle so-called proof assistants uh, that uh, are not fully automatic, but neither are they uh, tediously fully manual. And, uh, and Koch is one of the, uh, the prime examples of a system that fits in the middle. Why do we like the middle? Well, it's clear why we don't like the fully manual side. That's way too much work. The reason we don't like the fully automatic side is it's way too hard. Uh, people in AI uh, are still working very hard on building uh, actual automatic theorem proofers that can, uh, that can prove interesting theorems. Great strides have been made, but uh, we're not there yet. It's extremely hard. So to get work done in the meantime, uh, we have these tools that attempt to uh, uh, mitigate the low-level tedium while still relying on you, the prover, uh, for, the, uh, for the, the key insights. These tend to be power tools. So, uh, so caulk is not something that you can uh, pick up and be using at an expert level in just a couple of hours. Uh, you really have to understand what's going on and, uh, and spend some time with it. But uh, I think you will find that, uh, well, A, it's fun, uh, and there's the kind of video game effect that people talk about that, uh, that proofs are actually, there's an uh, uh, endorphin response when, when it says, yes, you proved that little lemma, uh, even if you've spent a ridiculous amount of time on it. So, uh, so there's, um, uh, sorry, where was that sentence going? <laughs> it is fun. Uh, and, um, and I think you will find that the work that you need to put into it to get good at it is, uh, is amply repaid. So it falls in the same category as you know, Emacs and tech and things like that uh, for people in our area. Uh, however, having said that, Koch is not the only good proof assistant out there. It's the one that we happen to have chosen uh, because it's one that I happen to like and, uh, and it's one that a lot of people in the PL area are choosing. Uh, but there are a couple of others that are worth mentioning. So, uh, so Isabel uh, is another very widely used proof assistant. Uh, and uh, its main advantage, I would say, from the point of view of the kind of work that we do, well, it has, it has two advantages over Koch. One is that uh, its notion of equality is extensional. Uh, and we'll come back to exactly what that means. But uh, but the, the short version is it eliminates a lot of low-level tedium in, uh, in proofs uh, of involving equality. Uh, and then a second thing is uh, it has a much better story about variable binding. So if you're, if you're doing proofs, if you're formalizing something that involves binding variables, like a programming language, uh, you're, uh, you're in for a certain amount of pain, no matter what. Uh, Isabel has a very nice so-called nominal data type package uh, that, uh, that enormously lessens that pain. So, uh, so those are some reasons why you might want to consider Isabel instead of Koch, although Koch is the one that we're dealing with today. Uh, another one that you might like to look at is uh, a system called 12 uh, that was uh, originally developed by Frank Fenning. Um, and uh, that I would say the difference between Koch and 12th, so 12th is also based on uh, a higher order intuitionistic logic. 
Uh, it is a little bit more explicit and less automated than, uh, than Coq. However, it's got a much better story, again, about, uh, about variable binding. So 12th is a more targeted tool. Uh, it doesn't work for everything. Uh, its logic is, is substantially less powerful than, uh, than Cox. Uh, but uh, if you are in the, uh, if your application is something that 12th is good at, then it's very well worth checking out because it may well be the, the very fastest path to, uh, to your goal. Okay, so enough about generalities. Uh, how many people here have successfully installed Cock on, uh, on their machines? Okay, almost everybody. How many people are still working on successfully installing Cock on their machines? Anybody at all? Cool. All right, one or two. Uh, so uh, one thing to make sure is uh, the Cock that you'll want for purposes of this week uh, is not the absolutely newest one. Uh, it's uh, 8.3, which, uh, which is the previous release. So 8.4 is, uh, is the present release. 8.4 is almost compatible with uh, the Software Foundation's stuff, uh, but since 8.4 is not uh, widely, av widely used yet, uh, we, uh, we're still sticking with 8.3 because there are a couple of places where, uh, where there are incompatibilities, so we have to choose. Uh, so you'll want Coq 8.3. Um, how many people have, although they've installed Coq, not done any playing with any of the uh, IDEs or, uh, okay, good. So, so let me talk a little bit about, um, about the possibilities there. So uh, you can drive Coq straight from a terminal window. You don't want to. So you want some kind of an IDE that's going to help you with moving back and forth in proofs and showing you the, uh, the state of the proof at each point. And there are two. Uh, there's one that comes with the Coq installation called Coq IDE, uh, which is a fairly simple uh, kind of uh, standalone GUI that puts up a window and shows you the text of the proof script that you're working on and has a couple of buttons for uh, pushing commands at the, uh, the underlying Coq interpreter. Uh, the other one uh, that, that people use is called Proof General. Proof General is a package that runs inside Emacs. So you have to buy into Emacs, but you should do that anyway. Um, <laughs> anyone who thinks that's false should use Coq IDE. Um, they're both fine. Uh, the Proof General is more sophisticated and does more stuff and is built into Emacs, which you should be using anyway. But, um, <laughs> But Coq ID is fine for our purposes. So, uh, so use whichever you prefer, just use one of them. Um, okay, so, so now a tiny bit about, uh, about the specifics of Coq. So Coq is uh, sort of two things. Um, it is a, uh, at its core, uh, is a functional programming language called Galena. Uh, a uh, a very rich and expressive uh, functional programming language called Galena with a couple of uh, slightly strange twists uh, from the point of view of mainstream functional programming languages. The main uh, strange twist that you'll notice right off the bat is that in Galena, all functions are total. So, every, so it has recursion, but all recursions have to terminate and it has to be obvious to the Galena type checker that they do. So, uh, so that can sometimes involve a little bit of um, uh, unusual locutions in the way that you write things. But usually, by and large, the way you write Galena programs is the way you write ML programs, and, uh, and even the syntax is similar in some ways. So you can think of Galena as uh, a core subset of ML or a, uh, or a type lambda calculus uh, with an extremely rich uh, dependent type system uh, based on well, what, what we saw this morning in, uh, in Bob's lecture. So, uh, so a typed lambda calculus with dependent types, also with polymorphic types uh, in the style of ML and Haskell and all your favorite languages, and also with uh, a built-in inductive definition facility, which I'll show you more of in a second. Uh, and for this reason, the core, um, the core lambda calculus that is uh, at the heart of Galena is called the calculus of inductive constructions. Okay, so, so I said there were two parts to Coq. 
One of them is Galena. It's at the center. And then wrapped around Galena uh, is the so-called tactics layer, the tactics language. Uh, and the, the way things work together, and again, we'll come back to this in more detail, but the way these work together is uh, doing proofs in Coq is essentially, as, as we've been seeing the last couple of days, constructing lambda terms of appropriate type. So, uh, so a proposition in Coq, in Galena, uh, is a type. A proof of that proposition is a term of that type, an inhabitant of that type. And, uh, and doing proof uh, in Coq is constructing terms uh, of desired types. Okay, so when you write down a theorem, you're proposing a type, and when you write down a proof, you're demonstrating that that type is inhabited. Now, uh, there are two ways to do that. The low-level way, which uh, kind of ignores this surrounding layer of tactics and just concentrates on Galena, is you can write down your theorem, that's a type, uh, and now you can just write down the term in, in Galena, uh, and now you're done. Okay, so you've, you've written a term of the appropriate type, and, uh, and that uh, uh, satisfies your obligation to, uh, to show that this theorem is, uh, is provable. Um, those proof objects, when the, uh, when the theorems are large or interesting, uh, can get big and they can get complicated. So, uh, so this is, in many ways, not a very nice way to work. You perfectly well can. Uh, and it's interesting to do it just to uh, kind of get the feeling of what's really down there. But it isn't the way that people really work. Uh, the way people really work is, um, is to get some help. So in the following style, which I'll, show, which I'll demonstrate in a moment, uh, propose a type and, uh, and now ask for some help uh, in constructing uh, a proof that is a term of that type. So we begin with the type and, uh, and a sort of empty term. Uh, and, now, uh, and now, if the type happens to be a, uh, an implication, well, how do you prove an implication? You assume the left-hand side and you try to, uh, you assume you have a variable of the left-hand side and you try to prove uh, the right-hand side, that is, find a term usually using that variable. Uh, of the type of the right-hand side. And so there's a command called intros uh, that, uh, that uh, kind of invents some variables and internally constructs a lambda uh, at whose body is uh, still to be filled in. Uh, and it gives, and it says, okay, now you need to prove this. So you're kind of, uh, you're interacting. So, so you have this, this tactic for, what is effectively a programming language where uh, you are imperatively uh, uh, manipulating the state of a partially constructed lambda term. And uh, when you finish filling in all the parts of the term, uh, then the proof is done and Koch accepts it and, uh, and you go on to the next thing. So, uh, so the way it works in practice is uh, you Pose a th you propose a theorem, and then you go into a different mode where you're, uh, where you're giving tactics, you're, you're applying tactics, which gradually massage uh, the, uh, the state of the, uh, of the proof uh, until the set of sub-goals, the set of places in the lambda term that aren't finished yet, where you haven't filled something in, uh, becomes empty, and then, uh, and then you're finished. The materials that we'll be using during these two weeks are uh, a book called Software Foundations. Uh, and this is one chapter of that book. Uh, this is a book that uh, a number of colleagues and I have been working on for some years now uh, that I use at Penn and that's used uh, a number of other places for a one semester kind of beginning graduate course on uh, the core theory of programming languages and constructive logic and theorem uh, uh, proving with proof assistance and so on. Uh, I think given the level of people in this room, we're probably going to cover most of the book uh, in the, uh, the few lectures that we have. So I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. 
Um, and uh, I, think, uh, I think you'll find that the book is, is written at a sufficiently basic level that, uh, that going through it at that speed uh, will not be a problem for most of you in this room. Um, in order to get ready for uh, starting in at a, a good speed on Saturday, uh, let's take a look at this first chapter and then I'll invite you to, uh, to start working on it at, with the aim of finishing all of the exercises in it by, uh, by the time we start on Saturday. So uh, every chapter in this book, every bit of this book is a cock script. So, uh, so you'll see on the screen, uh, usually when I'm lecturing, an HTML uh, presentation, which is automatically generated from the, the ASCII presentation, which is, which is the, the real one. Okay, so make sure I'm looking at the right version of this. Okay, so, so here's the .v file that, uh, that Koch actually understands. And not there. Why is that not giving me the window that I want? Okay. Okay, there we go. Just got it in. Uh, and this is the HTML version. So let's actually look at the text version for the minute. So this is what you see if you're using uh, Coq IDE. And here we have uh, a, uh, an inductive type definition. So this is the I part of constructive uh, CIC, calculus of inductive constructions. Uh, this says to Coq, we're defining a type so this is, a, uh, this is going to be, from now on, considered as a, a built-in type. Uh, you can think of it as a data type uh, in your favorite functional language. Uh, it has seven constructors. Uh, that is to say, there are seven uh, primitive expressions that are, that are inhabitants of this type. And if we do... Control C, Control C is the um, is the Coq IDE. Uh, sorry, is the Proof General uh, version. But uh, in some way, send it to Coq, and Coq's response is, okay, I've defined the type day, and I've also defined some other things that uh, that we're going to find useful later. In particular, uh, we've defined an induction principle uh, for reasoning about elements of this type. Okay, so we'll we'll come back to induction principles and all that. Uh, basically, what we're doing so far is just doing a little functional programming. Okay, so the, uh, just to overview, the contents of this chapter, this uh, uh, basics uh, first chapter of Software Foundations, uh, is some functional programming, which should surprise none of you, uh, and some very simple tactics, just a handful of tactics that you can use for uh, simple proofs, including simple inductive proofs, about simple functional programs. Uh, so it'll get your, uh, get your feet wet with both. Okay, so this was how to define a data type. This is how to define a function in Coq. So, uh, so this is Coq's notation for uh, function definition and then, uh, and then pattern matching. So it takes, a, uh, it takes a day called D, it returns a day, it does its thing by matching D with that list of patterns and returning an appropriate uh, element of the type day in each case. And we can present that to Koch and it says, okay, I got it. Now, I... Uh, Having done that definition, we can do some computing. So we can simplify expressions like next weekday of Friday. So, uh, so eval simple in uh, is a command to the cock top level that says take that expression, the parenthesized one, and, uh, and simplify it using the, the simple uh, simplification method. 
Koch actually provides several ways of, uh, of simplifying expressions. Basically, what all of them are doing uh, are using reduction rules, like the ones that, uh, that we've seen from Bob and Frank, uh, to, uh, to reduce uh, the expression to some simpler form. Uh, but, okay, so simple is the most used one. There are several others, so there you can say eval compute in something, uh, and uh, that applies a different set of rules which basically work harder. So eval simple just uh, does uh, kind of, despite its name, it actually isn't simple to explain exactly what it does, so I don't want to get into details, but it, uh, it does the, uh, the beta reduction steps that you would think, uh, plus some um, unfolding definitions like next weekday was a, uh, was a thing that we defined. Uh, and, uh, and these different uh, uh, modes of reduction have different behavior, for example, when they come to uh, definitions like next weekday. Okay, so let's not go into uh, detail about that uh, until maybe later. For now, all you need to know is Think of eval simple in as an atomic unit, uh, which asks Koch to please find the, uh, uh, a simple form of this, or please evaluate it to a result. Okay. We can also prove theorems. So this, although it says example, uh, it's actually a theorem. Uh, so. The, the key word example there is a synonym for, uh, actually there are several synonyms that all mean the same thing to Koch. So you can say example, you can say lemma, you can say theorem, proposition, uh, a few others. Uh, they all mean the same thing. Uh, they, uh, they're read as follows. The thing that comes next is the name of the, uh, of the theorem or example or whatever that we're introducing. And then what comes after that is uh, is a proposition, that is to say, a type. So the equality here uh, is, uh, is a, an equality claim, that is, it's, a, uh, it's, a, uh, it's an equality proposition. So this second line there is the proposition that is provable if the left and right-hand sides are definitionally the same, that is, the same modulo reduction. So when we submit this command to Koch, uh, it changes modes, as I warned you a few minutes ago it would. So we're now in the mode where we've, we've presented it a theorem, and now it wants a proof. Uh, and the way that we're going to give it the proof is by, uh, is by tactics. So here's the proof script. So the word proof uh, is basically just syntactic noise. Uh, you can actually leave it out, but, uh, but people put it in just for readability. So proof is a signal to the reader that we've entered proof mode and Koch is now waiting for a proof. Oops, sorry. Okay, so Koch is waiting for a proof. We're in a state where there's one sub-goal, namely the main goal. Uh, if we ever uh, apply a tactic, let's see, so what would be an example? Uh, if, we're, uh, if we apply the tactic that corresponds to the pair introduction rule, so if we're, if we're trying to prove a conjunctive statement, A and B, and we apply the tactic that corresponds to conjunction introduction, uh, that rule, that, uh, uh, that rule in the lambda calculus, uh, has two premises, or that rule in the logic if you want, has two premises, prove A and prove B. So if we apply the tactic corresponding to that rule, we're going to get two proof obligations. Please prove A, and when you're finished, please prove B. So at any given moment, there will be some number of sub-goals, all of which have to be eventually discharged in order, in order to be finished doing the proof. At the moment, there's just one, and for this very simple proof, there's, there's only ever going to be just one. So, next tactic, so, uh, so here's your first tactic. It's called simple. So, there's a potential for confusion here. We've seen the, the keyword simple twice. Uh, they're not exactly the same. They invoke the same reduction procedure, 
uh, but one of them was a top-level command asking Cock to just reduce an expression and show us the result. This one is a tactic that says, please take the goal and reduce it as much as possible, redu or reduce it using the, using the, uh, the simplification method. Uh, and the result is uh, a new goal, Tuesday equals Tuesday. Why? Well, because the, the simplified result of next weekday of next weekday of Saturday is Tuesday. Okay, so, uh, so that tactic resulted in this simplification. And now one more tactic uh, is so-called reflexivity. Reflexivity is a tactic that is particular to equality proofs. So, uh, so the reflexivity tactic is only applicable when the goal is an equality statement. Uh, and it proves the statement, uh, generating no subgoals if the left and right hand sides are indeed the same. Okay, so now uh, uh, the response from Koch is no more subgoals, the proof is done. And the last thing we do is issue the QED command, which takes us from proving mode back to the top level. Uh, and the response from Koch is test next weekday defined. Remember that test next weekday was the name that we gave to this theorem. So effectively what's happening is uh, Koch is building up a, a context, a context in the technical sense, a, a gamma, uh, is building up a context with, uh, uh, with bindings for all of the theorems that we've succeeded in proving. So the top level gamma of the Koch top level at this point in the script now contains a variable test next weekday of type next weekday, next weekday of Saturday equals Tuesday. Okay, any questions up until this point? Okay, please ask questions as we go along. All right. So, oh. yes, please. Is there any way to and, and print it in just the steps? There is. Uh, I'm afraid of what's going to happen when we do that, but let's try it. Oh, it's not so bad. Okay, so the, so the proof is e refl Tuesday. Why is that the proof? Because of the way equality is defined internally uh, in Koch, which we'll come to. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that in detail, but, uh, but just to preview, uh, Koch's internal logic, the, uh, the, the Galena language uh, at its core, is extremely simple. Uh, it hardly has anything built in. Basically, what's built in is implication. Uh, so it's extremely simple. Uh, not even equality is built in. In fact, uh, not, even, uh, not even the usual logical connectives, and or not, uh, uh, and so on are built in. All of those things can be defined. Uh, the definition of equality uh, involves a constructor called EQ refl. And we'll come back to the details. Okay, so, so this is showing us this EQ refl of Tuesday is the proof object in the calculus of inductive constructions uh, that has that type. Okay, so maybe speeding up a little bit now. Uh, the Booleans are not built in. We can define them. That's a little more usual. Uh, so Booleans are an inductive data type with two constructors, true and false. Uh, we can define functions like and or not. Uh, the only thing interesting about these is just showing you the concrete syntax for multi-argument functions. Internally, of course, all multi-argument functions are curried, uh, but you get, the, uh, you get the convenient concrete syntax. Uh, and let's see. Okay, so next thing to show you is uh, here. So this is an exercise. Right. This is an exercise, and it's preceded by a tiny bit of magic. So the magic is the word admitted there. 
uh, admitted is uh, a command that you can give Kalk uh, while you're in proof mode that says, I don't feel like finishing this proof, just trust me. So, uh, and we're using it in a slightly magical way here. You don't need to uh, understand the details of uh, that, that line that defines admit uh, at the moment. Uh, what's important is that uh, is the type of admit. Admit is a uh, is a value of type T for any T. Okay, so admit is a completely magical value uh, which we can use to uh, to fill in for a term of any type whatsoever. Naturally, if we ever tried to compute with such a thing, uh, we would have a problem. But uh, but uh, it, we're using it here basically just as a, as a placeholder for something that you're going to fill in when you do the exercise and for purposes of just having a script that we can execute uh, uh, later bits of when the, ex when the exercise isn't done, uh, we'll, uh, we'll fill in the body of this function with admit. So your job when you do this exercise, it's a very easy exercise, is to uh, delete the word admit and replace it by an actual term of the appropriate type. Okay. What else? Um, this is obvious. Uh, uh, Coq includes things that includes first class functions, just like all functional languages, and just like the, uh, the lambda calculator that we've been playing with so far. So, nothing really to talk about there. Uh, and then continuing on kind of quickly, because I want to give you... Um, ah, thank you. Check. Okay, so I, I showed you print. Print uh, takes something from the environment and prints its value and its 